Advisors, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Rua Advisors and our webinar partner, Akincom. First of all, a big thank you to all of you for devoting your precious time for this webinar on VCC with an overwhelming response. Before we proceed to the session, let me provide a brief introduction of our webinar partner and ourselves. Akincom is a leading global law firm providing innovative legal services and business solutions to individuals and institutions. It is one of the world's largest law firms with more than 900 lawyers and professionals in 20 offices with clients ranging from individuals to corporations and foreign governments. Hacking comes investment management practice comprising over 100 lawyers is a recognized leader in the fund management industry across the globe. We have Rich representing their US tax practice and Vivia representing their Singapore office and legal practice. They together have wealth of experience in structuring funds and they will be later taking us through US tax and legal aspects related to VCC. Coming to Dhruva, which uh, uh, KY and I represent, we work closely with our clients in providing practical solutions to their tax and business issues by managing their end-to-end -end compliance. Dhruva Advisors has eight offices across India and globally, including Dubai and Singapore, with a team of 300 plus tax professionals led by 16 partners. Personally, I'm a partner with the Dhruva Advisors and I'm based in Singapore. With over 27 years of uh, experience advising clients from various industries, including fund management industry, on a wide range of international and local tax issues. Before I go to the outline of this session, a few housekeeping points. There is a Q&A tab on the center bottom of your page. We encourage you to post the questions that comes to your mind while the session is still on. We will do our best to address those questions during the Q&A session towards the end of uh, this presentation. Uh, next slide. Too. So this is the, you know, basically the outline of the topics today. In the first part of the session, we'll be taking you through some of the Singapore tax aspects, which uh, highlights why Singapore is considered to be a preferred jurisdiction for fundraising from global investors. And we'll be taking you through in detail of Singapore VCC regime, including the taxation aspects around it. And then KY will be taking us through CRS and FATCA compliances for the fund entities in general. Then we'll pass on to uh, Rich for taking us through United uh, States taxation, which will include the personal finance and investment company election for Singapore fund, check the box for the Singapore fund and flexibility to marry the traditional uh, fund structures for US investors with Singapore fund. Region. In the last session, Divya will be taking us through the SEC regulatory requirements for raising funds in Singapore from US investors. Any reporting and other obligations for Singapore fund managers in the US will also be covered by PPI. With this, we can move to the next slide. Why Singapore is considered to be a preferred jurisdiction for uh, raising uh, of the funds by global investors uh, and increasingly so in the coming times. One key reason is Definitely the tax efficiency. Uh, in terms of the tax efficiency, Singapore provide complete tax neutrality for the investment income which is put in the Singapore fund here. So in, it puts uh, Singapore fund uh, almost at par with the uh, Cayman and various other uh, uh, locations which does not taxes the fund income, providing the complete tax neutrality to the investors in the fund. Apart from that, as compared to you know, many jurisdictions like Cayman, Singapore provides additional benefit of a vast tax treaty network with close to 90 tax treaties and with the, many of them with the emerging markets where generally the tax treaty play is important, Singapore fund structure becomes much more uh, relevant and attractive. Uh, also, uh, Singapore has a very robust and resilient financial center with the active involvement of uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is a central bank of uh, Singapore, the fund management industry has been flourishing uh, that provides for the local ecosystem whereby the fund managers, fund administrator, uh, which are already based in Singapore, provide for a uh, right ecosystem for the fund industry to uh, flourish here. 
Also, Singapore, as uh, you all are aware, provides for very pro-business environment. It ranks number two in the world for ease of doing business. And also, it is it is have a, it is having a very good skilled workforce, which uh, places it uh, number one in Asia Pacific and number three globally. With uh, Singapore uh, evolving as a prominent global financial services center, it was quite timely for Singapore to come out with a regime like variable capital company, which provides for a corporate fund entity framework with great flexibility, both from legal as a taxation perspective, as we will see in the next slide onwards. So Singapore VCC as a concept, uh, you know, it, it, it's basically a fund entity in a corporate form. It can be used for both traditional as well as alternative asset strategies. It can be used for either open-ended or closed-ended fund entities. And as we will see uh, in the later slide later, uh, that it can be either used as a standalone fund or also an umbrella fund with multiple sub-funds. And uh, different sub funds can have different investors and segregated asset and value. Uh, as, as far as the legislation goes, it is uh, governed by the Variable Capital Companies Act. That's a separate Companies Act dedicated to VCC and Securities and Futures Act. And it's uh, regulated and administered by ACRA. Uh, MES regulations are generally vis a vis the fund managers, but uh, VCC is regulated by ACRA. We move to the next slide. So this is uh, uh, the two type of uh, VCC fund structure. It can be either a standalone VCC where only one fund is supposed to be promoted. In that case, the investors uh, uh, will come in into this standalone fund, which in turn will be making investment. One of the preconditions for the setting up of the VCC in Singapore, that it must be sponsored by a Singapore-based fund manager, which will have the fund management agreement with the VCC. As compared to a standalone uh, um, uh, VCC, which can only float one fund, in an umbrella VCC, it's a single legal corporate entity which can have different segregated portfolios, which are completely ring fenced uh, in terms of uh, their asset liabilities from each other. So within one entity, uh, once you have floated that entity, you can keep adding the sub funds as and when you have the opportunities available to create more. Uh, funds, launch more funds for different set of investors or different set of strategies. We can move on to the next slide. So these are the benefits of the VCCs from uh, US and other global investors perspective. Uh, the VCC can be uh, subjected to the check the box election, which is important uh, for uh, uh, tax efficiency for the US investors. It provides for complete ring fencing of assets and liabilities in one sub fund vis a vis the other sub fund in the case of the umbrella VCC. It is uh, also more efficient from taxation perspective, including uh, you know, the tax treaty availment, because uh, you need to avail certain tax incentives at the umbrella level. And with the launch of additional sub funds, they don't need to apply separately for the tax incentive, and they can just piggyback on the umbrella uh, entities tax incentive. And typically the redemption of capital uh, can be done at the funds NEV and it does not require any lengthy uh, you know, solvency or any other shareholders approval procedure, which is required typically in the conventional company cases before the launch of the business. It also provides for flexibility to list the funds for trading purposes and uh, also, from a confidentiality perspective, there's no requirement for financial statements to be made public, and uh, uh, that offers great uh, privacy to the investors. Even the investors or shareholders' information is also not publicly accessible as compared to a conventional company before the launch of VCC, where the financial statements are available to the public uh, as well as the investors' information is available to the public on payment of certain fees. And it also allows for uh, uh, a master feeder structure where VCC itself, uh, if uh, you need multiple layers, you can use as a feeder as well a master structure. And there are some tax incentives which are catering to uh, you know, this master feeder structure, ensuring the complete tax neutrality of a master feeder structure as well. 
and dividends can also be paid out of uh, capital and there is no need to, uh, that the fund should be in the profit for declaration of the dividend simply the nav reduces to the extent of the payment of it coming to the key singapore tax aspects uh, it is treated as a single entity for uh, corporate tax purposes and tax exemption under section 13 or 13 x can be extended to the vcc on an application to mas as i mentioned earlier once an umbrella vcc is approved on 13 r and 13 x then launch of further sub funds within the same investment objective as submitted to mas will continue to enjoy the tax incentive without taking further approval from mas also generally the tax residency certificate is available to vcc uh, you know because uh, it is not difficult to establish that it is controlled and managed from singapore due to the existence of singapore fund manager and that makes you uh, accessible to close to 90 tax treaties across the world and also for those funds uh, issuing any uh, uh, notes uh, debt notes to their investors uh, typically there is a 15% withholding tax under the domestic tax law of singapore on the interest payments but under uh, uh, a vcc regime which has availed 13r or 13x incentive the interest withholding tax is completely waived for the fund managers in singapore who are managing the vcc uh, if they satisfy certain criteria like 250 million dollar of AUM and so on, then they can also be eligible for a 10% concessionary tax rate on an application to MAS. And also their existing uh, GST remission for the funds which have been extended to VCC, uh, typically a VCC uh, making a fund management uh, fee payment to a local fund manager may net net suffer a uh, uh, GST cost of anywhere from 0.8 to 0.9 percent of the fund management fee, which is very very minimal. You can go to the next slide. So these are the uh, this is a synopsis of uh, two of the tax incentives available for the VCC. Either you can go for a 13R or 13X. We'll explain the difference. But before that, the common uh, uh, incentive is that they have the same set of qualifying income, which is exempt from tax. There's no difference in that. 13R can be availed only for a Singapore corporate entity, which VCC is. So uh, you can apply for a 13R for Singapore uh, VCC. And uh, 13X is available for corporate and non-corporate entities. Uh, again, VCC is eligible for 13X as well. In 13R, the only disadvantage is that there are certain set of non-qualifying investors like Singapore corporates, uh, where if they exceed certain threshold of uh, investment in the corpus of the fund, then there can be a financial penalty applicable on such investors. So from an administrative perspective, that makes a task cumbersome for a 13R fund to track and uh, provide declaration to MAS for existence of such investors. In 13X, there is no such tracking condition, so administratively it becomes easy. Uh, only uh, additional condition which you need to satisfy in the context of 13X vis-a-vis -vis 13R is that it needs to have a $50 million of uh, AUM apart from uh, another important condition, which is that it needs to have minimum three investment professionals in the fund manager managing the VCC as compared to uh, 13R case, uh, there is no such requirement. Both the funds require minimum expenditure of 200,000 Singapore dollar every year. And typically that would mean that even 13 R size, generally uh, from a very economic perspective, not go below 10 million. You can move on to the next slide. So these are some of the illustrative fund structures for the US based investors investing into Singapore VCC. They can come directly into the VCC uh, and uh, even the VCC can be, you know, check the box uh, uh, and they can avail all the benefits uh, accordingly. Or they can form a Cayman feeder or uh, even Delaware LLC feeder. Uh, alternatively, even a VCC can act as a feeder. So you can interpose another VCC uh, and that, that can be checked the box. And there can be another VCC which can be interposed as a blocker as well. So VCC provides for as much flexibility as maybe a Cayman or a Deraver LLC. We can move on to the next slide. Other key aspects uh, <clears throat> for the VCC is that uh, 
uh, when you launch new sub funds, as I mentioned earlier, you don't need separate MES approval for availing the tax incentive. Uh, for umbrella VCC ascent and liabilities of the each sub fund are completely segregated. We discussed this earlier. And VCC can adopt uh, any accounting standards, whether it is SFRS, IFRS, or reverse cap. But once it adopts at the umbrella level one uh, set of uh, financial statements, it is uh, obligated to adopt the same financial standards for all the sub funds. Also, it is possible to invert re domicile of foreign corporate entity. Uh, as VCC. There are some conditions, but those conditions are not very onerous. For example, if you have a Cayman SPC, and you want to avail some tax treaty benefit for the Cayman SPC, which we, we, you cannot, of course, because Cayman does not have much of tax treaty network. And if you want to migrate that Cayman SPC into Singapore, the very same entity carrying the same portfolio without uh, any uh, disturbance of its holding can be moved from Cayman to Singapore. And uh, it can uh, just continue as the same going concern, the same legal agreements continue and everything. So that uh, facility is also uh, possible for the VCCs. Uh, also, the economic conditions, as we saw that 200,000 of local business expenditure or even 50 million for uh, minimum AUM of 13X fund, they can be satisfied at overall umbrella level. Uh, you don't need each of the sub fund to satisfy that criteria. We can move on to the next slide. So this is uh, this is a key benefit also for setting up the VCC in Singapore. Uh, till January of 2023, MAS has committed to provide 70% grant for the setup cost of VCC, which includes not only corporate secretarial and uh, tax support, which uh, we provide, but it would also include, uh, include the legal support, which, for example, Ek Income can provide from their Singapore office. And uh, it also includes uh, you know, uh, 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 the cost for regulatory compliance matters during the setup phase and also the tax incentive application, which we make for the funds. So it, it is a very significant benefit because it's available up to 150,000. Uh, uh, so typically, most funds we have seen you know, uh, have uh, spent within that limit. And uh, uh, as a result, they just need to uh, fork out uh, just 30% from their own pocket. So it's a significant benefit to us. Uh, we can move on to the last slide. So these are some of the recent trends uh, for the VCC where it has been used. It has been used for agri-based strategies, private equity, uh, AI-based, uh, Asia-focused funds. We have seen real estate funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, fintech funds, and technology funds. So it is being used in the variety of uh, strategies. So with this, uh, I will pass on uh, 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 the presentation to my uh, colleague, uh, KY. KY uh, has the uh, immense experience in the financial services industry. He has been a partner with the PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, Financial Services Division, post which for 12 years, he was with the Stein Chart, uh, both in Hong Kong as well as in Singapore, where he was leading the implementation of uh, FEDCA and CRS uh, across the uh, institution. And since then, uh, he has been practicing in the fat and CRS related matters exclusively. So in Singapore, you know, if there's one go-to person uh, who is dealing purely with fat and CRS uh, aspects, that's KY. Over to you, KY. Yep. Um, thank you, Mahit. Uh, good morning to everyone and good evening to those uh, dialing in from the United States. Okay. Um, the first bullet point uh, basically sets out the local rules in Singapore that implement CRS, Common Reporting Standard, and FATCA. And so uh, both those regimes have been implemented in Singapore under local law, and so they're commonly referred to as the CRS regulations and the FATCA regulations. Um, basically, in a nutshell, uh, this reporting framework, which was introduced in 2014, FATCA, and then 2016, uh, CRS, uh, requires the VCC to report information relating to its investors to the tax authority in Singapore, the IRAS. 
thereafter, the information will be passed on by the IRAS to the tax authorities of the um, respective investors' uh, tax residents. Okay, the second bullet point makes the point that uh, it's not just the VCC that um, has obligations under CERS and FATCA, but also the fund manager entity, any care interest entities, feeder entities, uh, and possibly other entities within a fund group. The third bullet point uh, deals with procedural issues. Uh, there's usually not no great rush with FATCA and CRS. Uh, basically, registration due date is 31 March of the year following the year in which the entity was established. Um, so there's plenty of time for that. Uh, however, uh, in practice, we find, uh, we, we usually advise our clients that uh, a GIN number registration should be made in the year the entity is established so that the entity has uh, is identified as a reporting financial institution with a GIN number because in practice, the GIN is generally required when bank accounts are opened uh, in Singapore. The second last bullet point makes the, makes the point that uh, it is the tax residence of the fund uh, that is, is key. Right? So if the fund is a resident in the Caymans, it's, it, it reports to the Cayman authorities. Likewise, if the fund is resident in Singapore, it reports to the Singapore authorities. So all VCCs would report to the Singapore authorities. Any funds that we domicile to Singapore uh, in, uh, in order to bring itself within the VCC framework would therefore start reporting to the Singapore authorities. Okay, uh, next slide. I think I've made the last bullet point, page 15. Okay, the, the point we're trying to discuss here is, um, are all investors reported and what is reported? Now for individuals, it's quite straightforward. We report all individuals if they are based in a jurisdiction that has signed up to CRS reporting. Uh, which is you know, quite a number of jurisdictions now, uh, up to 100 have signed up as participating jurisdictions and the reporting jurisdiction list is increasing um, rapidly. Now, for entity investors, there are three main categories where the investor is itself another financial institution, for example, another fund or um, you know, a, a sovereign controlled um, investment corporation, then there's no reporting with respect to that entity. However, uh, it is important to make sure that uh, there is enough KYC so that you can prove the negative, which is, uh, you know, we have enough documentation and processes in place to prove why a particular investor is not a reportable account holder. Okay, the second sub bullet point is where the investor is an active non-financial uh, entity. Oh, I think, sorry, I apologize, there's a typo there. Now for active non-financial entities, uh, the, the best example would be a treasury entity within uh, an active conglomerate um, or an entity within a listed group. Uh, in such a case, there is reporting to the country of tax residents of that entity. So for example, if a Hong Kong entity were to invest in a Singapore VCC, then the information relating to that entity will be reported to the Hong Kong tax authorities. The last bullet point is the one where uh, in practice, it is the most relevant. Uh, it is where investors use a passive uh, non-financial entity then in such a case, reporting is not just to the country where the entity is established, but also to the jurisdictions where controlling persons of that entity are tax resident. So uh, again, take an example where someone establishes a Hong Kong passive NFE, and if the controlling persons uh, of that entity are say in the UK 
or the US, then the financial account of that passive NFE will be reported not just to Hong Kong, where the entity resides, but also to the UK or the US or any other jurisdiction where the controlling persons reside. The phrase controlling person is interpreted um, consistent with the FATF recommendations adopted in Singapore. The key information to be reported are the name and tax identification number of the investor, country of tax residence, obviously, so that we know uh, which country the information is to be reported, the address, the account balance, and any payments, distributions, or redemptions. Uh, so in a nutshell, the information to be reported is actually quite simple, and that's usually not difficult in practice. Uh, the main procedures that need to be established are identifying the CRS and factor status of the investors, right? whether they are passive NFE, active NFE, or a financial institution. There are also other complex categories, such as charities, um, uh, supranational organizations, uh, such as uh, Development Bank, uh, etc. Um, so those are the more complex cases. Okay, the next slide, please, slide 16. Okay, the timeline for submission of the CRS and FACA returns in Singapore is 31 May of the year following the year end. So the year end is usually 31 December. Um, so we've got five months to prepare the, and submit the CRS and FACA reports. Um, the second bullet point is the important one um, that fund managers um, should be aware of. Uh, the CRS and FATCA regulations in Singapore uh, create an obligation and a responsibility on the fund entity and the fund manager to develop and maintain processes to ensure CRS and FATCA reporting. So again, once again, I would like to uh, make the point that proving the negative is always um, something that people overlook. Uh, so it's, I, mean, I often hear people say, okay, we don't have many reportable investors, uh, but that doesn't mean that you do not need to have processes and documentation in place to evidence why those investors are not reportable. Yeah, and, the, and the tax authorities in Singapore have issued uh, quite a comprehensive CRS compliance framework that they expect um, fund managers and fund entities to be aware of and to comply with. Right. So the fourth bullet point uh, is basically just to remind the fund and the fund managers to make sure that they satisfy themselves that their service providers have the subject matter expertise, not just to report, but also to help establish these processes and procedures to prove the negative. The second last bullet point is another um, important procedural governance concept, which is to make sure that there are procedures in place to identify the concept of change in circumstances, you know, particularly where investors change their country of residence. Now, this is quite common with um, individual investors. So for example, uh, the wealthy Indonesian family uh, residing in Singapore that returns to Indonesia after their children um, have been educated and uh, are now working adults, or professionals who move from Hong Kong to Singapore, uh, etc. Okay, the last bullet point is a, is a simple one, uh, just to make the point that um, for FATCA reporting, there may be certain cases where US tax forms uh, need to be completed. And certainly for US investors, they are quite familiar with uh, completing a W-9 form. So that is in practice often the most convenient way to establish the factor status of that investor. Okay, I'll end my presentation there and uh, move on to introduce Rich. Uh, Rich is with uh, Akin Gum and he's based in New York. Uh, like Mahib and myself, he's a, he's a tax professional, but he's an expert in US tax law. 
and with particular focus on private equity funds and hedge funds. Um, and um, particularly in structuring um, the funds so that uh, the US investors uh, have greater tax efficiency when the funds invest internationally uh, in this example today out into Asia. So uh, over to you, Rich, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, KY. Um, so I'm just gonna have a few slides here just to talk about some of the basics, uh, you know, main considerations, high level considerations that investors will wanna focus on. But this, uh, this first slide here gets, it just gets into the entity classifications um, from the US perspective, US tax perspective that you need to think about that in, uh, US investors will be very focused on uh, in particular. So there are default rules in place that uh, in an entity is typically considered a flow through entity or it's considered an opaque corporation. Um, and you know, for entities formed outside of the United States, the default rule is that uh, it's considered a corporation if all members have limited liability. And this is a lot of uh, most of the fund entities we deal with uh, have this risk of defaulting into the status of being a corporation, um, which U.S. taxable investors, in particular, often don't want. Uh, you know, there's a there's always some tension uh, and conflicts because different types of inventor, uh, different types of investors may want a vehicle to be treated one way or or, or another. But th this uh, this default classification to corporation is why we file these uh, form 8832 elections. You may often hear people refer to filing a check the box election or just uh, for shorthand CTB. Um, what they're referring to most often is filing this form in the context of noting to the IRS that a given investment fund entity is being treated as a partnership. Um, and I note here on the slide that there's some entities where you, you can't do the 8832 check the box selection. Um, one of them would be a, a Singapore formed uh, public limited company by default will be considered a corporation and you can't uh, override that. And so thinking about it in terms of the different types of investors, you've got the US taxable investors who almost always want to be investing through uh, partnership vehicles. Uh, and there are various reasons for that. Uh, you get some, some uh, beneficial US tax treatment, but in particular, in the case of the international arena, uh, a US taxable person doesn't want to be invested in an entity that's considered a, a passive corporation, um, specifically using the, uh, the parlance of US tax law, a passive foreign investment company, uh, often referred to as a PFIC. So you, you wanna be familiar with this term PFIC because US investors may request in a side letter, for example, that you'll make efforts to not uh, have them invest in a PFIC. Um, and, and so what's going on here is that the US government uh, believed that there was an abuse of the US tax system taking place by US taxable persons parking their investments uh, outside the United States in passive corporate entities um, that are not obligated to run the income back to the US person on an annual basis. Um, and therefore you could defer indefinitely uh, paying US taxes. Now, one way, one, another uh, phrase, you, another thing you wanna know about is QEF elections. If you either the fund entity itself is treated as a PFIC or the fund, although it's treated as a partnership, ends up investing uh, inadvertently in a PFIC because you, you choose a uh, you know, portfolio company that, that turns out to just have a bunch of passive income for a few years. Uh, one way to mitigate the consequences of this regime is if the US uh, taxpayer files what's called a QEF election. So you wanna be familiar with that uh, concept of QEF elections because investors, US investors often request uh, information or, or rights to gather from the fund information so that they can make a QEF election. 
uh, and we can switch to the next slide. Thank you. So, so now on this slide, uh, it just discusses what about the viewpoint of non-US investors um, or US tax exempt investors. So non-US investors actually may prefer that the entity, uh, uh, an investment fund entity be considered a corporation for US tax purposes. Um, so this is why sometimes you have multiple feeder funds, feeder funds in a structure because different investors want uh, to, to come through different types of vehicles. So the, the main reason why a non-US investor would care about the US tax classification of a non-US feeder fund entity is if there were some risk of uh, investment activity that could be, could be considered being engaged in a US trade or business. So for a lot of the Asian funds that uh, Divi and I uh, work on, they don't have a, a major presence in the United States in, in terms of the managers are not necessarily in the United States uh, and nor are they necessarily targeting US investments. So sometimes there's not um, a significant risk of this being engaged in a US trader business. But if there were, the non-US investors would want to be investing through a corporation so that they would be blocked from having this uh, attribution of being engaged in a US trader business. But as to add complexity to it, in certain cases, non-US investors may actually want to invest into the US on a flow through basis. Um, and, and that would be the case if you were trying to claim treaty benefits to lower the US dividend withholding rate. So if you said, oh, I wanna invest in uh, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, US corporations, and I don't want to be subject to the full 30% withholding rate on the dividend flowing out of the US because I'm, for example, uh, you know, an Indian resident, I want to take the, take the benefit of the US-India tax treaty. Uh, you're going to have to uh, invest on a flow through basis through partnerships uh, because if you were invested, for example, in a, in a Singapore entity treated as a corporation, you would lose the potential for the treaty benefits to lower the dividend withholding. Uh, and then, so finally, here about uh, the, the U.S. tax-exempt investors. So there's different types of U.S. tax-exempt investors. Um, but the main thing you want to know is that some of these investors want to invest in corporate entities and be blocked, uh, and others want to invest on a flow-through basis. Now, what, what the U.S. tax-exempt investors want to be blocked from is an argument by the U.S. IRS that they are, they are engaged in any type of uh, trade or business. Um, and you'll hear this referred to as unrelated business taxable income that they're trying to avoid or UBTI. So uh, you know, in short, what, it, what this means is if you have a tax exempt uh, educational institution, they shouldn't be you know, producing sneakers. Um, so some of these tax exempt investors are, are, are very sensitive to this point and want to be blocked. Um, others don't care because they uh, figure that oh, I'll just pay um, slightly more taxes because of this. So it's really an investor by investor basis, uh, but sometimes you need to structure to, to deal with uh, these investors. Um, and on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just you know, briefly, I want to mention um, what might cause this UBTI for the U.S. tax exempt investors, because you know you, you do want to be mindful of these investors because often uh, they're the ones bringing the largest amount of, of capital into some of the the funds that we help raise. Um, so you know, one one way that a, a fund can generate UBTI is if it borrows uh, money on margin. So the, the US tax laws, uh, you know, they penalize that and, and treat it as UBTI for the US tax exempt investors. Uh, another way is if the tax exempt investor is investing through partnerships and the portfolio, the portfolio companies themselves are partnerships. So in my example with uh, you know, selling sneakers, if there's a sneaker company that's a partnership and the investors investing through a partnership um, then you, the activity will be directly attributed back to the investor. Uh, and then finally, sometimes in the private equity context in particular, uh, 
you, we see funds that are, are able to earn some services income uh, for you know, uh, consulting that they give to a portfolio company or maybe management fees or breakup fees, transaction fees. So you have to be mindful uh, of that because some US tax exempt investors will say, I, I don't want any of that income to flow to me um, because I don't wanna deal with being engaged in a, in a trader business. Um, so that's another thing to be mindful of. Now, in conclusion here with all these considerations in mind, what we often see is uh, in the PPM, you know, the fund offering document, it will say that the fund is going to be treated as a partnership uh, under US tax principles, uh, but that the fund has the right to create additional entities, AIVs, parallel entities um, that may be treated as corporations uh, either at the, at the outset of forming the fund or, or later on, depending on uh, who the investors are, what the, what the investments are. Um, and so the, this umbrella VCC option uh, allows for a lot of flexibility because these entities can, are, are able to selectively choose to you know, have a series that's treated as a corporation and another series that's treated uh, as a partnership so it's a very convenient regime uh, for all these considerations uh, just discussed. So, so that's it from uh, you know, main uh, considerations from a US, uh, US tax perspective. And I'm gonna uh, now pass on, we can go to the next slide, uh, pass it on to my, my colleague, Divya. Divya and I have worked together for uh, many years and she has a, a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, in helping form funds and advise on the ongoing operation of funds. Uh, usually we do uh, private equity funds, but also we help advise uh, hedge funds and venture capital funds and, and other structured fund uh, strategies. Um, so you know, without further ado, uh, let, me, let me kick it off to my colleague Divya to discuss uh, US regulatory considerations. Thanks, Rich. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Divya Thakur, and I'm going to talk about the legal and regulatory aspects of raising capital from investors in the US. Um, to kick things off, on the first slide here, I have a list of the various regulators and the various laws that you would need to think about if you wanted to market your fund to US investors. I'm going to now pause for about 45 seconds and give you time to memorize these names and I will quiz you on these names right after. I'm just kidding, there is no quiz and you obviously do not need to memorize these names and hopefully your lawyers have that sorted for you. Um, but I also want to sort of point to you that you also don't need to really worry that if you were to raise capital from investors in the US, you would be subject to excessive regulatory scrutiny by US regulators. And in the course of my presentation, I hope to be able to give you some more comfort on that point. And hopefully you'll see how you can navigate these sort of extensive laws and regulations um, that otherwise appear so overwhelming in a manner that will make sure that while you're compliant with the US laws, um, you're only compliant to the extent you need to be and are therefore not subject to excessive regulatory scrutiny. So on the next slide, um, I will start talking about the Investment Companies Act. The Investment Companies Act essentially seeks to regulate businesses um, that invest, reinvest or trade in securities. In essence, these are retail funds or mutual funds in the US. Most private funds are able to rely on an exemption from registration under this act. There are two exemptions that are commonly used, uh, the 3C1 exemption and the 3C7 exemption. On the next slide, I'll give you a bit more information around these exemptions. The 3C1 exemption is what I also like to call as the 100 person exemption. And that's because you can rely on this exemption if you offer your fund to no more than 100 investors. 
we find that most managers in Asia are actually able to rely on this exemption. There are some sort of slightly more complicated rules that one needs to bear in mind when analyzing compliance with 3C1. Um, but by and large, we find that most managers are able to utilize this exemption in Asia. The other exemption is the 3C7 exemption, and that's a qualified purchaser exemption. So to rely on this one, you have to make sure that investors in your fund are qualified purchasers. Qualified purchasers are essentially individuals who have about 5 million uh, US dollars of investments or entities that have 25 million US dollars of investments. Um, one other point on qualified purchasers I'd like to highlight is that it, it would also include knowledgeable employees. And knowledgeable employees are employees of the fund or of the manager who, as part of their regular function, engage in investment activities. Now, whether you rely on the 3C1 exemption or the 3C7 exemption, you have to make sure that you do not engage in any public offering of your securities. And what amounts to public offering of securities is something I'll cover in the next slide, as that is sort of described in the Securities Act of 1933. We can go to the Securities Act. Yeah, thanks, Pramish. Um, so Securities Act essentially seeks to regulate offering of securities in the US. Um, and any offering of securities requires a registration. However, there are certain exemptions that are available. I'm going to talk about the most commonly utilized exemption in this case, which is available under Regulation D. Regulation D essentially offers two avenues um, to managers who are looking to market funds in the US. Uh, the, one ad, the first avenue or the 506B avenue essentially requires that you do not engage in any general solicitation or advertising of your fund. What that means is, that you should not, for instance, run adverts in the Wall Street Journal. You should not be giving press interviews on your product. You should not sort of you know, publicize the offering on your website or on your LinkedIn pages. Um, so one has to be very mindful of the communication that you're having with the investors or with public in general on your product. The other thing to bear in mind when relying on this particular avenue is you also have to make sure that your investors are accredited investors. And accredited investors is also essentially a net worth test. And they're individuals with a net worth of at least a million US dollars or entities with a net worth of about 5 million US dollars. On the next slide, I'll talk about the other avenue which is available under Regulation D, which is the 506C avenue. Um, and under this path, you can engage in general solicitation and advertising. So you can give public meetings on your product. You can you know, run page long advertisement on the Wall Street Journal. But even though you are allowed to do all of this, managers rarely rely on this particular exemption. And the reason for that is that to rely on this exemption, you have to take reasonable steps to verify the accredited investor status of your investors. There is some guidance on what can amount to reasonable steps, but there's a lot of ambiguity. And the burden of sort of whether you've taken reasonable steps or not, it really rests on the manager. And so most managers steer away from relying on this exemption. I say most managers, but pretty much all of our clients um, do not use this exemption. Everyone uses the 506B exemption. Now, whether you go down the advertising path or whether you go down the non-advertising path, you have to make sure that you don't have any bad actors in the system. And bad actors here is not a reference to George Clooney. Bad actors here essentially is talking about uh, you making sure that certain persons, and these include your investors, your directors, your officers, and your advisors. So certain persons who are involved with the fund haven't committed a certain sort of prescribed list of bad acts. 
Um, the list of bad acts, to give you a few examples, would include something like they shouldn't have received an SEC disciplinary order. They shouldn't have been you know, convicted in connection with a filing with the SEC. Um, so it's a very sort of defined list of bad acts uh, that one needs to sort of verify with respect to these covered persons. Um, the other thing to bear in mind with respect to Regulation D is that you're required to undertake certain filings if you rely on this exemption. Uh, the filings can be classified into sort of two buckets. Uh, one is a filing that you, you make at the federal level with the SEC, and that's the Form D filing. But you also have to sort of analyze and think about whether you need to make any filings with um, the state securities regulators, because every state in the US has a separate securities law regime, and those regimes might require certain filing as well. These filings typically don't tend to be complicated and are usually a notice filing, but you have to still make them. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the key things to bear in mind on the Securities Act. On the next slide, I'll touch upon another key um, regulation that comes into play for managers looking to market their funds in the US, and that's the Advisors Act. Um, the Investment Advisors Act essentially seeks to regulate investment managers who are described as managers that provide advice with respect to securities for compensation. As you've probably figured out by now, there is a theme flowing through this, which is that the purpose of all of these laws is to require some kind of registration with a regulator in the US. But what you also would have noticed is that there are also exemptions that most managers outside of the US can avail of um, under each of those laws. And the Advisors Act is no exception to that. So there are certain exemptions that are available. And for the purposes of this presentation today, I'm going to talk about a couple of most commonly used exemptions. Um, and I'm, I'm touching on these exemptions because while there are others, we've sort of in our experience realized that most managers are in Asia are able to rely on at least one of these two exemptions. So it's quite likely that you will be able to sort of rely on one of these two. The first one is a foreign private advisor exemption. And I'll sort of give you a bit more information on that on the next slide. So the foreign private advisor exemption is available if you have no place of business in the US. You do not hold yourself out to the public in the US as an investment advisor. You have less than 25 million assets under management from the US, and you have no more than 15 investors in your fund. You have to meet all of these criteria to be able to rely on this exemption. Um, if, if you don't meet any single one of these criteria, then you can't rely on this exemption. However, if you are sort of a startup fund manager who's just getting started in the business and setting up their sort of first fund, it's good to think about whether you can avail of this exemption. Because if you can, in fact, rely on this exemption, and if you can meet all of these criteria, then you don't have to make any filings in the US. You don't have to do anything at all with the regulators, except you'd have to still make a disclosure in your offering document. Uh, but those disclosures are sort of, you know, no more complicated than disclosure you would have had to make anyway otherwise. Um, so it's good to be able to sort of bear this in mind. And if you can't rely on this exemption, then you can sort of think about the next exemption that I want to talk about, the private fund advisor exemption on the next slide. The, thank you, Pravesh. Um, so the private fund advisor exemption is available to funds that are essentially qualifying private funds. And to think about whether you're qualifying private funds or not, you have to sort of think back again on the 100 person exemption, and you have to think back again on the qualified person exemption. So if you're able to rely on one of those, then you're a qualifying private fund. Uh, and you also have to make sure that you are in fact a fund. So if you have a managed account if, you know, for an investor in the US, then you're not a fund, so you're not a pooled vehicle, and then you will not be able to rely on this exemption. The other criteria to be able to rely on this exemption 
is that you should have no more than 150 million um, assets under management. Now, while that's the sort of baseline for most managers who are in Asia, that baseline does not apply because on a more sort of slightly nuanced reading of the regulation, if you do not have a place of business in the US, then the 150 million cap does not apply to you. So you could technically raise you know, 500 million or a billion dollars or more globally, including from US investors, if you do not have a place of business in the US. For this exemption, however, you have to make um, a filing with the SEC. And the filing is not a full-blown registration as an investment advisor with the SEC, but it's a slightly more sort of detailed filing. Um, but it's a factual filing, so it requires information on you know, your office, your place of business, the funds you raised, etc. Uh, but it's not, I would say, an excessively complicated filing to make. We have a couple of more minutes. So on the next slide, I'd like to sort of, you know, quickly touch upon the Commodities Exchange Act as well, because this is this can be quite relevant for uh, the audience that we have today. Um, the Commodity Exchange Act essentially comes into play if you trade in commodity interests, which have been very widely defined to include future contracts, options, swaps, currency hedging, etc. Um, there is one exemption that is very commonly relied upon uh, in this context. Uh, and that exemption requires you to meet quite a few sort of criteria, but they're not complicated criteria and would be things you will anyway meet if you sort of comply with all the laws that we just spoke about. Um, but the one other thing you have to bear in mind to be able to rely on the exemption here is that you have to make sure that the aggregate initial margin premium uh, or security deposits do not exceed 5% of the liquidation value of your portfolio. Or you have to make sure that the aggregate net notional value of your positions does not exceed 100% of the liquidation value of your portfolio. So it's essentially a test that is tacked to the liquidation value um, of the portfolio. To rely on this exemption, you have to make a filing, but it's a very simple filing. It literally takes five minutes to make that filing. So it's not complicated. It requires only certain sort of, you know, factual information, name, address, contact detail type information to make this filing. Then on the next slide, I'd also like to just sort of touch upon uh, ERISA. We don't have to go into a whole lot of detail here, but what I want to mention is that ERISA laws essentially seek to regulate private pension plans in the US. There are sort of several state pension plans that we are now seeing quite actively invest into funds in Asia. Uh, and those state pension plans, while not governed by ERISA, might be sort of governed by similar state laws. So one has to sort of think about that a little bit. But by and large, if you're sort of looking at ERISA investors in the fund, if you can make sure that you have no more than 25% of ERISA money in your fund, then you don't have to really worry about ERISA at all. If you go above that 25% limit, then you, know, you need to think about whether uh, there's an exemption available or whether you need to sort of fully comply with the ERISA laws. But in our experience, most managers in Asia uh, are actually able to sort of, you know, keep the ERISA money below the 25% threshold. And so this rarely becomes an issue. Uh, we have some managers in Asia who have sort of, you know, complied with ERISA fully and have more than 25% US money. Um, but there are only a handful of those sort of managers. So I think with that, I've sort of hopefully given you a good overview of the various laws that come into play and how you can navigate those laws. Um, and I think we can now open the session to some Q&A. Thank Thanks a lot, Divya. We have certain questions coming in uh, for you and me. There's a question that what geographic investment restrictions apply uh, to VCC? Uh, is there a minimum investment or proportion of the fund that need to be invested in Singapore companies. Uh, so 
uh, in terms of the later part of the questions, there's no commitment at all required for investment into the Singapore company. And uh, also from a Singapore legal perspective, uh, 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 further you may add uh, Divya, but uh, there's no restriction on geography. You can invest uh, in any geographies across the world. Of course, uh, you know, there would be uh, certain AML CFT requirements in certain territories uh, uh, may be prohibited, for example, North uh, Korea, for example. Uh, but except for that, there is no geographic restriction. Yeah, I think that's right, Mahib. So we have set our VCCs or have sort of advised managers who've set our VCCs uh, with sort of a very broad geographical focus in Asia. Uh, and we've seen these funds sort of focus on pretty much every geography in Southeast Asia, um, you know, India, Philippines, Indonesia. So th there is no sort of geographical investment restriction that uh, you need to bear in mind. Right. In fact, vast majority of these VCCs do not have any investment in Singapore, uh, as a matter of fact as well. Just to yeah. We move on to the next question, which uh, seems to be for Rich. Uh, why the exposure of uh, ECI-based taxation in US perceived to be higher merely due to tax transparency of the structure if there is no activity at all carried out in the US? Uh, this is a, a very good question, and you know. So, so first, I'll say that the the answer is that the uh, there is a fairly low risk here, which I think is why we typically see these funds formed as partnerships uh, when they are are targeting investments outside of the U.S. Um, however, you know, it's not free from any risk. Uh, be, you know, to the 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 answer here is that there's a concern that what if there's some set of events that all of a sudden results in you inadvertently having some activity in the US. So for example, you are invested in a, uh, you know, through transparent entities into um, some portfolio company in Asia that all of a sudden uh, is part of a merger or, and, then, and then the activity somehow gets swept into the United States or what if you invest in a portfolio company in Asia that for some reason um, has decided to itself be treated as transparent for US tax purposes, but maybe someone um, you know, didn't ask that process or you didn't realize, or maybe even that uh, change in entity classification was done after you uh, made the, the portfolio company investment. So, you know, th that, is a little bit, I'm giving you uh, somewhat remote risk scenarios, but but that is the reason why, even if you thought you have no US activity, you know, there may be some lingering risk that you could have US activity. And Rich, what would be the US activity investing, say, into a listed US uh, equity uh, without any uh, kind of base on any representative sitting in the US? If you're merely investing into, say, the stocks of Apple or any other S and P five hundred, will that uh, be considered as an activity in the U.S.? A oh, very good question. So, it's unlikely that that would be considered activity in the U.S. Um, there are special rules in the case of a, a company that has a significant amount of U.S. real estate. So. So in almost all cases, the answer to your question is no, there's, there's not going to be a, a risk. But if you, if you somehow invested in a U.S. Corp, corporate entity portfolio company that had 75% of its assets in U.S. real estate, for, for whatever reason, the U.S. tax regime is punitive, uh, I think, because there was a perception in the 1980s that well, all these foreigners are buying up our real estate. Okay. And <laughs> so, there's a special tax regime, but 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 typically, no, there would be no ECI risk. Right. The next question, again, seems to be for you, Rich, uh, is that the check the box, uh, can it be done at the suffering level or it has to be necessarily done at the umbrella level? Yeah, this is a very good question and one that I've seen uh, or, over the years come up a few times. And the IRS rules on this are not crystal clear. So the taxpayer needs to you know, uh, interpret it as, as you need to, to get comfortable with what you're doing. So in some cases, I've seen an umbrella parent entity 
um, really not do anything. It has no assets, no liabilities, um, and it's just off to the side. And you know, so there, there may have been cases where uh, I was involved where someone decided to ignore uh, the, the umbrella entity, but it, typically the advice I give is for the, the main entity to do the check the box selection, to be treated as transparent, because that preserves some optionality for you. And I have seen investors show up, US investors show up and say, this looks like an interesting structure, but can you send me a structure chart for the fund showing the classification for US purposes of every entity? And we don't want to be invested in any PFIX. So there's a perception that, oh, if, you know, if even if I'm invested in the, the, just the sub fund, if this, the parent entity uh, has not done a, you know, an 8832 check the box selection to be treated as transparent, then I may be in a PFIX. So, so I, I would go ahead and, and uh, file the 8832. But one other point that I'll make is that you don't always have to fight. If you, you, you're only filing these uh, check the box selections uh, for these non-US entities, if you want to override the default corporation status. So for some of these sub funds, you might say, oh, I want to treat that sub fund as a corporation. So you actually don't need to do the uh, election in that case. That's very, very useful, uh, very insightful, uh, Rich. Thanks a lot. The next question uh, seems to be for, uh, I think, a bit general. I like to take that. What are the advantages of moving to Singapore uh, VCC? I suppose that's the question. Is Singapore VCC visa, we continuing with, say, a Cayman structure. So one of the key advantage of moving to Singapore uh, could be the Singapore's tax treaty network. And you can simply redomicile your Cayman structure to Singapore, especially where you think uh, treaty is going to help you. But we understand that there would be many strategies uh, where the treaty is not the play. So some of the reasons uh, we are seeing, uh, especially from an optical and perception perspective, especially in Asia Pacific and the European jurisdictions, they are viewing uh, Cayman with the uh, uh, you know, a different lens as compared to you know, more robust locations like Luxembourg or Singapore, because Cayman has been on the gray list of uh, FATF on and off. So there is a general tendency to kind of uh, uh, look for uh, funds in more robust locations like Ireland, Luxembourg, Singapore. So that could be uh, another reason. Uh, so uh, anybody from the panel uh, like to add to that? I think that's right, Mahib. So I think, you know, and this is particularly true in the context of funds in the subcontinent who are sort of looking to invest into India. And I know we have a few sort of Indian fund managers on this webinar today. Um, and quite often, I think with Cayman structures, people worry about whether, you know, EU investors would be comfortable investing in a Cayman structure because Cayman Islands has been put onto the EU um, blacklist a few times and then taken off it and taken on it. And there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Now, Cayman Islands has taken on board, um, you know, the feedback they've got and they have sort of sought to tighten their AML procedures and, you know, they are sort of making progress. But you know, it's the kind of thing that once you have made an impression in the market generally, it is something that managers still have to think about when it comes to raising capital from European investors. Um, and this is also now sort of increasingly becoming true in the context of funds that look to invest in India, because you know, in India, the government has sort of been saying, oh, we will not accept a certain portion of money or money above a certain threshold if it's coming from jurisdictions that are not FATF compliant. Uh, and because jurisdictions like Cayman and Mauritius tend to sort of go on and off on the FATF compliant list, that's become a concern for managers, particularly if they're managers who are looking to invest into sort of the financial services space into India. So we see that as sort of the key distinguishing factor between why somebody would want to move to Singapore. Um, not, you know, the other sort of thing to add there is that there is a lot of push being given by the Singapore government and the regulators here to get the funds regime into play and there is sort of uh, 
you know, you can get certain subsidy that Mahit sort of referred to in his presentation if you were to set this up. And all of that seems to have sort of really gained traction in the recent times uh, in Asia. So for managers who are in Asia, instead of sort of looking far out to Cayman Islands, we are seeing a lot of them at least look at BCC. They may or may not go down that route after sort of considering everything, but they at least give it some consideration and some thought. So that, that's very, very useful, Divya. And apart from that, uh, uh, we do not see particularly any downside of Singapore vis-a-vis -vis Cayman, except uh, that Singapore tax incentive regime does not apply to only a very few uh, you know, uh, investments like crypto. Currently, uh, it is not very uh, specifically covered uh, under the legislation, although there is a possibility to take a view that uh, crypto derivatives, certain derivative instruments could still be covered. So unless one is going for some crypto strategies, uh, you know, pretty much Singapore from a tax perspective or even from costing perspective, perspective is not uh, worse off as compared to Cayman. So uh, its uh, tax treaty network can only add further. So, so I think that was our last question. So uh, thanks a lot, all of you to attend this session. And if you still have any questions, please feel free to email us. We'll be circulating the slides uh, you know, uh, today itself uh, with the contact numbers of the speakers, uh, contact uh, email IDs of the speakers. Feel free to uh, revert to us. Thanks a lot, Rich, uh, Divya, and KY. We'll uh, call off the session. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.